guys need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. I'm going to pass them out. Um, do we have another music center? Or should I just use this one? Yeah, all right. And if you have your Bibles already, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I think it's great. We kind of did this without planning. It just happened. If you were here last night, Pastor Dan taught on uh, the first 12 verses, or the first 11 verses of chapter 12. And today's study, we're actually going to be looking at the verses immediately following that. So if you were here last night, you kind of have a good foundation uh, for where we're starting. Uh, but even before we get into that, as you're opening your Bibles, I, I just want to kind of reiterate what we went over last week. You know, the, the reason why we are meeting here and, and the reason why we decided to change it up a little bit, um, if your parents don't know, usually right now we're playing a game, uh, making fools of ourselves, doing something, trying to, you know, get everyone to get to know each other. Uh, but we're doing it a little different because, uh, as we've been saying, we, we want to reach the youth. We want to give them ownership of their own walk with God. We have two primary goals as we go throughout this month of, of teaching through the series. Uh, we have an outward goal, which is we want to reach out to the youth in the community for Christ. And the way we're doing this is, of course, in the summer we have our outreaches. During the school year, we're out in the schools uh, helping with the Christian clubs. It's amazing. We have Elijah in the back is helping out at Summit High School. He's one of the leaders there. We have these two young men right here. Uh, Mundo and Jordan are going to be trying to start up the Christian club at Harupa Hills. Um, we have Eric, who isn't here tonight, but he's involved at A.B. Miller, as well as uh, Clarice is still involved, but Marissa's graduating. They are involved last year. And so we're, we're reaching out into our high schools, and, and our goal as we reach outward is to be that salt, be that light that we read about in the scriptures, uh, that we can point people towards Jesus Christ. You know, it's amazing, as we go out into the Christian clubs, and uh, a lot of them are dead. You know, they, they just kind of, there's two or three people that meet. It's the, the president and the vice president and the secretary, that's it, you know. And there's no life in these Christian clubs. And so uh, our prayer is that as, as we're building up the youth here, that we can plug you guys into every Christian club in Fontana. I know some of you are in like Bloomington, Rialto. Uh, you know, that'll be later steps. But starting in Fontana, we can go into these clubs and bring them to life. Bring in the Word of God, bring in evangelism, and really reach out to the community. Because the schools are suffering, and, and we can be that light that points people back to Jesus. So that's our outward goal, is to reach out in our community, reach the youth around us. And what you'll find is that's actually the, the goal of the entirety of the church. I mean, you see us out there evangelizing. Uh, Pastor Dan is always out there at the schools with us. Uh, but more specifically for the youth, we want to reach those, uh, our peers, those who are kind of on our level, our own age. And so that's our outward goal. Our inward goal is to develop and empower you guys as the youth to take ownership of your own walk. To not just be here walking through the steps, uh, reading your Bible because you're supposed to, uh, doing certain things because I have to. Oh, I, my parents say I need to do this. I can't watch these movies. I can't listen to this music. That's not what we want it to be. We want you to have your own walk with God where you are, are serving in the church, where you are following the Lord's commandments because you truly believe with all your heart, mind, and soul that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and He died on the cross for your sins. And when you can do that, you overcome all these obstacles as you go out into college and you meet these professors that tell you that God's dead. Or as you go out into the workplace and, and really you're the only Christian and, and the influences all around you are, are pulling you away. And if, if you take that ownership of your walk with God, uh, I mean, you can face all these obstacles, right? Through Christ, all things are possible. We find strength in Him. We find peace in Him. We find encouragement in Him. And so that is our, our outward goal and our inward goal. And of course, it's to combat the problems that we see of this drop-off rate. Uh, another problem that we see uh, is that uh, there's a difference between what is taught at the church and what's enforced at home. And so that's why we invited the parents in to kind of get that unity of mind that unity of vision, so that as we're teaching, it's not being knocked down at home. I used the, uh, the illustration during the announcements of playing Jenga. Have you guys ever played Jenga? Where you, you kind of knock out the blocks on the bottom, you got to kind of build them on the top, right? At, at church, it's a lot like that. If it's not being reinforced in the home, it's like playing a game of Jenga with the life of your child. We're trying to add blocks on top, we're trying to build them up, but then they go home, and everything's being knocked out on the bottom, and there's no support. 
And so we're hoping that through this month that we can encourage the parents, encourage the youth uh, to work together and that we wouldn't be a statistic, that we would be able to reach out to our community, that we would have that ownership over our walk with God. Now last week we talked about the foundations of the church in Acts 2.42. We talked about uh, relying on the Word of God, prayer, fellowship, and being Christ-centered. And this week, we're actually going to look, as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to look at the body of Christ. And if I can read the first few verses here, I think they kind of sum up the message quite nicely. Verse 12 says this, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. And so what we see here is that the the Bible describes us as the body of Christ. I mean, if you can think about your body, and and really it's going to be a great illustration for how we work together. I mean, how useful would your hand be without your arm? I can move my fingers, but it's only because it's attached to my arm. How useful would your arm be without your shoulder? How useful would any of your body be without your brain? I mean, it all works in conjunction together. And I thought a great way to illustrate this would be to uh, show you guys some pictures of a few diseases, just to kind of hit the point home, uh, when our body stops working together. The first three are are pretty mild. I think everyone should be okay with this. We can bring up the first image. Uh, The first image we see here is called jaundice. Uh, this is caused by liver failure. So your liver is actually really important in getting rid of toxins, different things like that. And when your liver fail, fails, one of the side effects that you see from it is that the pigment in your skin actually starts to go yellow and your eyes go yellow. And so here we see a lady affected, affected by jaundice. You can see the yellowing in her eyes. And I'm sure if you compare the, uh, her face now with a, her face before she had jaundice, I mean, it would be much more... Uh, you know, lightly colored than this, it wouldn't be so yellow. So this is John, this is caused by liver failure. The next picture we see here, it's called elephantiasis. Mm. Um, this man's legs are swollen. You see this, this disease is in our lymph, lymphatic system. If you don't know what that is, we actually have a system in our body that's in charge of moving fluids out of our body. We kind of leak a little bit. I don't know if you guys knew that. Mm. And we have these vessels in our body that move the fluids out of the way. And they they kind of recycle them. Well, when that stops working, you'll see people in their extremities, especially the legs, the fluid will build up and they'll swell really big. So that's elephantiasis. That's when we have failure in our lymphatic system. This third one, as we pull it up, this is an AIDS victim. And now most of us know about AIDS. This man is very, very weak, very uh, malnourished, very skinny. And it's because his immune system is actually going out. It has nothing to do with his stomach or eating or anything like that. It's because his immune system stopped working. He's very unhealthy. And when your immune system stops working, I mean, you get all these different types of diseases. I was looking up, like there's one called thrush. There's, uh, you get a lot of these weird diseases that normally we don't get. Normally your body's strong to fight it off. But when your immune system is compromised, you get all these diseases. They're kind of gross, and I thought they might make some people grow up. So I decided not to show them. But you can see that this man is clearly not healthy. And it's because he has HIV. He has AIDS. All right, so this last one, before we bring it up, uh, I will let you guys know it is a little bit more graphic. If you do want to look away, I'll explain it a little bit before we bring it up. It's called, uh, let me look at the name here just so I don't get it wrong again. Cyclopia, which reminds you of kind of a cyclops, right? As our body develops, uh, it's interesting. Our brain and our head starts kind of as one clump. But as most of us know, in development at some point in time when we're a baby, our brain goes into two halves, right? We also start off with one eye socket, which splits into two. Our nostrils start as one, splits into two. And one gene, so this isn't system failure, this isn't your immune system, this isn't liver, this isn't uh, your lymphatic system. This is one gene. If one gene is messed up, uh, the following image results. And so we're going to show it for just a few seconds. If you want to look away, go ahead. Uh, but this is called cyclopia. This is a baby. Uh, they're usually dead at birth. They, they usually don't live very long or they die in the womb. Uh, we can take it down now. But that's cyclopia. This is when one single gene is not working in the body. 
And it's amazing to see that. And, and it shows us how important every single part of our body is. Every single gene in our body is important to our life. One little mistake can cause something like that. In the same way, you guys, we in the body of Christ are each important. Mm -hmm. And as we read the passage today, we're going to look at three, uh, three main points. If you're taking notes, you can write them down. The first is that we're all essential. We're all essential. God requires each and every one of us. There's not one of us that God does not require to work for Him. He has a plan for all of us, and we're each essential in His plan. The next one is that we're all equal. You see, God assigns our gifts. He gives us uh, opportunities as He sees fit. Now, if God has assigned us, that means that just because I'm up here teaching doesn't mean I'm above you. Just because uh, you're in charge of bringing snack, or you're in charge of greeting, or, or you're doing sound, or maybe you haven't done uh, much yet but sit, it doesn't mean that we're greater or lesser than anybody. God tells us that He gives us these gifts, He assigns us in, in what we do, and He calls us in equality. And the third point we're going to look at is that uh, as we exercise the gifts, we're called to be together in unity. We're called to be together working as one body. Just as our whole body works together, we are so called to work together with each other. So we're all essential, we're all equal, and we all walk in unity. So if we can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll start here in verse 15. And of course we, we introduce between uh, verse 12 and 14, and verse 15 picks up speaking about a variety of gifts. It says, If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as He pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? And so from this section, we see that we are all essential. And we see here at the beginning that it says, If the foot should say, Because I'm not of the hand, I am not of the body. And this is speaking directly to those who feel excluded from the body of Christ. I, have any of you ever felt that way? Maybe if you go to your Christian club and, and you feel like, oh man, that guy up in front, he can talk, he's funny, everybody listens to him. I'm not like that. Or maybe you're looking at the people up here playing worship. You're like, man, if I played a guitar, everybody would run out of this room right now. If I tried to sing, I mean, glass would shatter. I can't do anything. That's what this verse is speaking against right here, that we are not to have that attitude. You see, we're all essential in the body of Christ. We work together as one. And, it, and it's, it's like the foot saying, look, I'm not a hand, so I'm not a part of the body. Does that make it true? No, it simply has a different role. It's like the, the ear, the, what does it say? The ear saying, I'm not an eye. But where would be the hearing if the ear was gone? Wouldn't be there. You see, each member of the body has an essential role to the functioning of the entire body. And that's what this passage is speaking about. We should not feel excluded from the body of Christ because we are essential. And verse 17 talks about this. It says, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? You see, we're not just acceptable in the body of Christ. We're not just here as a part of it, but we're essential. God desires to work through your life just as much as He desires to work through my life, just as He desires to work through Pastor Dan's life. He wants to use you where you're at. He designed you with a specific purpose in mind that you can reach out to those around you. You see, if we were all uh, built the exact same way, I mean, it would be great for us to get along with each other. We all have the same interests. We could all get up here and play guitar together. That would be kind of crazy. But there would be an entire group of people in the world that we could not reach. That wouldn't even give us the chance to speak to them. You see, we're all essential in the body of Christ. 
We're essential not only to reach out, but to encourage each other. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 through 25 tells us that we are a body called together to stir each other up in good works. So we work in unity not only to, to reach out and to perform the will of God, but to, to encourage each other. We're, we're called to, to kind of uh, be that catalyst with, with our friends, with our family in Christ. That, I mean, it, it was great because I was talking to Elijah and he was saying that uh, him and Mundo got to talk the other day. And as we mentioned, they're both trying to help out in their Christian clubs. And they were able to encourage each other. They were able to talk to each other, uh, uh, share with each other. And Elijah said he was so encouraged by their talk that, that he just wants to, to continue in the Word of God, to continue steadfast in what he's been doing. You see, Mundo may not have known that before now, but he played an essential role in the life of Elijah, even if only for a second. We're called to stir each other up in good works, and we're each essential in the functioning of body, the body of Christ. And I find it very interesting, in verse 18, it says, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. So now, if you're in this room and you're saying, I don't, I don't think I could be used by the Lord. I think maybe he made a mistake in my life. I don't have any, anything to offer. This verse is telling us that as the Lord pleased, he has placed you in the body. He has put you there. It was His will that you would have your personality, that you'd be as tall as you are, that you'd be the ethnicity that you are, that you would have the hair color, the eye color, everything about you, God designed for you because He had a specific plan in your life in the body of Christ. Did you know that? He has a perfect will in your life. And it says, He designed us, He planned for us, and as He desires, He places us into the body. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. This speaks of the Lord working in our lives. He has a plan for us. Nobody's excluded. You guys, you know what? We can each find our role in the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. If you guys want to write this down, you don't have to turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 says that by the Holy Spirit, God shows us. He works in our lives through the Holy Spirit to show us our role, to show us things that nobody else can see. And He wants to work in our lives. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, goes on to say this, For who has known the mind of the Lord, that He may instruct Him? But we have the mind of Christ. You see, as Christians, as we are indwelled with the Holy Spirit, God works in our lives, and as we seek out His will... He's going to show us what our role is. He's going to show us that we're essential in the body of Christ. Uh, someone asked me uh, just a couple weeks ago, Stephen, how did you know you wanted to be a teacher? Well, I didn't know at first. I grew up my whole life not really knowing. I, I kind of went to church. I, I didn't really seek out the Lord. But as a senior in high school, it was the first time I, I legitimately sought out the Lord and took kind of ownership of my own walk with God. And you see, part of that was being in my word every day, like we talked about last week. Was praying every day, having that fellowship with believers. And as I truly saw the Lord for the first time in my life, He spoke to me by the Holy Spirit that I was to be a teacher. Now, many of you know the story that I, I kind of denied that calling for about four years. I, I did my own thing. But guess what? As I saw the Lord again after I graduated college, He reconfirmed that in my life and look at where I am today. You see, we seek the Lord and He shows us by His Holy Spirit. He instructs us, and the Bible says that we have the mind of Christ. If you're wondering where your position is in the body of Christ, I would encourage you to seek Him, seek His will. And He will show you. It, Pastor Dan spoke about these verses last night. If you look at 1 Corinthians 12, 11, speaking of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, this should be on your same page. It says, But one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. You see, God works in our lives. He, he gives us those gifts. And He desires that we can use them. You see, we're all essential in the body of Christ. Now as we move on, we're going to look at that we're all equal in the body of Christ. Have you guys ever felt unequal? 
show of hands? Have you ever felt less than other people? I think that happens to a lot of us. I think even myself, you know, as I was going to school of ministry, and your first message, get this, is two minutes long. Two minutes, that's it. You just have to stand up in front of people, and for two minutes, try not to pass out. <laughs> And, and, you know, the whole time as we're going through school, we're listening to these amazing teachers. I mean, they, they just know the Word of God so well. And we go up there, and on one verse, we have to speak two minutes. And it feels like days as you're up there. Your first message, let me tell you. It's one of the hardest things I had to do to get up there for two measly minutes and speak. And in that moment, as I'm trying to, to muster up the courage, trying to remember what I had written down on my paper, sweating, trying to get everything out, I felt less. I felt that there is no way that God could use me to influence anybody if I can't even talk for two minutes on one verse of the Bible. But you see, God brought me up. He encouraged me. You know, none of us are less in the body of Christ. And we're going to look at that right now. Verse 20 says, But now indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather these members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary. Have you ever felt weaker? Have you ever felt lower? Have you ever felt that, that God kind of shortchanged you when it came to the talent area? <laughs> I think a lot of us go through that. I mean, some of us are born amazing singers. Some of us are born naturally gifted in speaking to others. Most of us aren't. Most of us have to work at it, and we require the help of God. But he says, look, even those who seem weaker are necessary. And those members, verse 23, of the body, which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. You see, there are many members but one body, you guys. And we're all equal in the body. You know, Pastor Dan mentioned this last night. Have you ever gotten like a tiny little injury? And before you get that injury, everything's great. You sleep well through the night. I mean, everything's peaceful, you know. And you get the, the weirdest injury in the world, and suddenly your entire world is just terrible for like weeks to months on end, right? I mean, have you ever gotten a splinter that you couldn't really see? And like every time you try to, try to grab something, you like drop it because it hurts, and you're like, where is this thing? <laughs> Tiny little splinter. You know, a few months back, I was playing basketball, and I stubbed my, my little toe. <laughs> the littlest one. It does, uh, what are they for? It doesn't seem like it does anything. I stubbed that little toe. The next day, half my foot was bruised. I, I had to raise my feet as I slept. I couldn't walk. I couldn't go down the stairs. I had to like hop on one foot. All because my little toe was injured. <laughs> Even worse than that, Chris, can you raise your, your, your thumb up hand? I'm going to use you as an example today. See that big cast he's got? We were playing soccer and... and, and uh, I was kind of involved a little bit, <laughs> and he fell, and he landed on his hand. You see, at, fine, at first he looked fine, he went and got x-rays, they said they couldn't see anything wrong. But there's this little bone in your thumb, this tiny little bone, that even on the x-ray is hard to see. They couldn't see it when they took the x-ray the first time. They sent him home with a splint and said, we'll look at it later, we don't know. But there's this tiny little bone, and guess what, that little teeny bone that almost seems useless is the one that he broke. Oh. And it hurt so bad that, that he couldn't lift his hand like this. Because that's how important it was. You see, all of us are important, all of us are essential, and all of us are equal in the eyes of God. And, and this, this verse explains this, that I cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. See, we all have need of each other in the body of Christ. And this is something I really want to encourage you guys in, especially as the youth, as you, you grow into young adulthood, as you're going out, that so many times in the body of Christ, as, as we're taking roles, as we become teachers, as we become worship leaders, whatever it may be, that we can get prideful. Is anyone here prideful? Is it just me? No? Okay, cool. There's a few. I'm glad. 
See, we have got, we've got honest people in the audience today. We can get prideful. The body of Christ, you guys, has no room for pride. Proverbs 16, 18 says this, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit goes before a fall. You see, God has called us each to different parts in the body, but He doesn't want us to, to feel above anybody else. The eye cannot look to the hand and say, I have no need for you. You see, at the body of Christ, we can do this, uh, and I wrote down three primary things that, I, that the Holy Spirit mentioned me that we, where we can have this pride. One is when we're Christians longer than somebody else. We've been walking with the Lord. We grew up. We know all the Bible songs. I mean, you know, you're talking to somebody, you mention the name Noah, I'm like, who's Noah? And you're like, whoa, this guy, <laughs> he's got some learning to do. But let me tell you, I've seen time and time again where this person who has no idea who Noah is, no idea who Abraham is, doesn't know the little children's songs, but yet they know the grace of God way more than we do because we grew up in the church. They know that God saved them from their sin because they grew up in that sin. That's all they knew for so long. And as, as Jesus Christ saves them, they're able to see that grace more clearly than we are. And, and they, they're, they're excited about the Lord. And they're out evangelizing more than we are. And they're out reading their Bible more than we are. And yet we can get this pride, oh, he doesn't know. He doesn't know Jesus loves me. How do you not know that song? Everybody knows that song. No, that's not it at all. We shouldn't get prideful over people that because we've been Christians longer. In fact, we should come alongside them and say, hey, if you don't know who Noah is, we're going to open our Bible to Genesis and we're going to read about Abraham, we'll read about Noah, let me show you. We can instruct them, show them everything. The second way is when we desire specific positions in the church. Sadly, we see this happen. Oh, I'm going to be the teacher. No one else can be the teacher. Oh, I want to be the worship person. I'm higher than everybody else because I'm in worship. No, we, we shouldn't allow the position that God has given us, the gift that God has given us, to blow our heads up. See, we're all equal. The third one I put here is that we put low value on others for looks, race, gender, weight, height. I shouldn't be that way, you guys. God has called us together as a body of Christ. He's given us specific attributes in our lives. And we're not to be putting each other down for it. You know, I, I grew up in a high school group, and, and there was a lot of putting people down for the, the stupidest and smallest reasons. And you know, you guys, when you put someone down, even if there's a little bit of truth in it, or if you're joking, whatever it might be, you're damaging that person. And you know this from personal experience in your life. When someone says something about you and you hear it, maybe you, you don't go all crazy about it, but it, it sits there in the back of your head and you're thinking, Man, am I really that ugly? Am I fat? Am I... I wish I was taller. I wish I could speak better. I wish my hair was longer or looked as good as that guy's did. I was, that girl said, whatever it might be. And it, it kind of nags at you behind you and it cripples you and, and as you go up to do what God has called you to do, that those doubts run off in your mind and you're like, I can't do this. I'm unequipped. No one's going to listen to me. God tells you at your school, talk to this person. Now, who am I to talk to this person? Look at me. I don't have anything in myself. We shouldn't be putting people down. You guys should be lifting them up. You see, no one is greater. No one is lesser. God has called us all, designed us all for specific reasons to work for Him. As the body of Christ, we come together and we work for God. And thirdly here, as we move on, we're going to look at unity. And I want to start uh, back in verse 22 and we'll read through a little bit more. It says this, No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor and our unrepresentable parts have greater modesty. You see here he's speaking of the equality that no matter what value we put on a certain part of our body, here he's using our body as an example. That we cover certain parts. So is my arm more important because it's uncovered? He's saying no, we, we might put lesser value, but, but we cover our body because it is more valuable. See, we, we don't have that, that discernment that the Lord has. And he's saying that what we think may not be properly true. 
Even the smallest member of the body of Christ has an important role. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unrepresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. In verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body. Now this word schism speaks of, of a dividing, of a fight, of a war. I mean, think about like angels versus dodgers. Think about like Democrat versus Republican, Crips versus Bloods. I mean, that's what it's talking about. This, this, this dividing, this, this uh, coming against each other. God doesn't desire that. That's not of the Lord. You see, God gives honor to each of us and He wants us to come together in unity as the body of Christ. He doesn't want us to be separate, but together working for Him. He gives us those different positions as He sees fit because He doesn't want disunity. And we talked last week about fellowship, right? Does anybody remember the word that I, that I asked you guys to repeat a few times? Koinonia. Koinonia, this fellowship, right? And we talked about this unity that we're to have as we gather together. That's what this is speaking about today. That as the body of Christ, we're to come together and that we're to have that unity. He's called us to be unified as the body of Christ. Verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. You see, this is uh, the goal of the unity, that we would care for one another. But it's not only the goal, but it's the means to reach that goal. Now, what do I mean by that? By that, I mean that as we work together as the body of Christ, as we're caring for one another, it's going to bring us unity. John 13, 34 says this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And as the body of Christ, really that is what we're called to do as we come together in unity, is to have that love, have that care for one another. And it's interesting because in, in this passage, as Jesus is speaking to his disciples, this is directly after he served them by washing their feet. And after he washed their feet, he reveals Judas as his betrayer. And as Judas leaves, he says this to his disciples. You see, it's in direct contrast to this disunity that Judas had just caused among them. He betrayed the Lord. He's going to, about to go and bring him to his death. And as he leaves, the Lord says, look, love each other. Be unified with one another. God calls us to live in unity with one another. You see, when you guys come to the youth, our, our goal as we're here is to try and make you feel welcome. I hope I've done that. I hope I, I, I've... Uh, had a smile, I haven't been rude. I know that sometimes we can do it without trying. If I have that done that to you, I apologize. But really, as you come, we want to make you guys feel welcome. And as you're here, especially for a longer period of time, we want you guys to help in that experience of making others feel welcome. You see, as a lot of people come to our church, they, they say that the one thing that kind of sets us apart from uh, other churches is that we feel like a family. That we have that love for one another, that we are unified. That there isn't this backbiting, putting each other down, and, and that we're actually functioning as a body. And we want to ask you guys to do that. And a lot of times we'll play games to do that, kind of break you guys out of your shell. We'll ask you to, to do things you're not used to doing. We'll ask you to introduce yourselves to strangers, which for some reason is like the biggest fear that most people have. I don't know why. Go talk to that person. I don't know them. That's why you should go talk to them. <laughs> You know, as you come here, we're going to ask you to break out of your shell. And it's because we want to encourage unity. And you know what, you guys? This is very important. Because I, I'm going to say this. I want you guys to listen. You guys can minister to somebody that I cannot minister to. Mm -hmm. You guys can reach somebody as they walk through these doors, whether we're in here or the other room, that is not going to listen to me. But they'll listen to you. You see, maybe they had a bad experience at church and they just think that all pastors are liars or, or they're kind of shut off to the idea, but you're not a pastor. They might sit there the whole time trying to play on their phone, thinking about random things, doodling, whatever, just not paying attention. But before and after the teaching, guess what? You have the opportunity to talk to them. 
And you have the opportunity to, to be a real Christian in their lives. Someone that led by the Lord, blessed by the Holy Spirit. And guess what? Through your life, they can see something different than they've seen their entire lives. Maybe they're not open to the idea of church, but at school, they'll talk to you. You have a math class together. You've got to sit next to each other every day. You might as well talk to them. And they begin to see something different in your life. They would never once in their life step through the threshold of the church. And yet you are the living Word of God, the living Bible next to them, that you can speak that to them into their lives and show them the love of Christ. You guys can minister to somebody that I have no access to. When I go to your schools, I can go to the Christian clubs. I can't do much else. But guess what? You have the power to establish a Christian club, invite speakers out, go on to your campus, pass out literature, whatever. I can't do that. Pastor Dan can't do that. But you have that power. And you see, God says that if we come together, that we can work in unity, and that we can reach the world. He says, go out and make disciples of all the nations. Preach the name of the Lord. Glorify Him. You see, this is why we're all essential in the body of Christ. This is why we're all equal in the body of Christ. And this is why we must all work together in unity as the body of Christ. Because we each have our separate roles. And verse 26 speaks towards this unity. I want you guys to see how unified that God wants us to be. It says, And if one member suffers all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. You see, guys, in every aspect of life, we're supposed to come together. We're supposed to glorify the Lord together. When one of you guys is hurt, as you guys come to me and you speak to me, I'm hurt for you. We should hurt for each other. Mm. And as we're glorified and as we're honored and, and as, as good things happen in our lives, we rejoice together. Too many times I see, you know, when one person is kind of getting credit or they're getting honored, everyone else looks at that guy, oh, you're just showing off. Look at this guy, he just wants all the honor and glory for himself. When really they're trying to honor the Lord, they're just doing their work for the Lord, and, and sometimes we will get honored in that. But yet you, you just kind of, you feel kind of lesser, so you kind of put them down. It shouldn't be like that. When one person is honored, we're all rejoicing. We all come together as the body of Christ. And that is the great thing about being Christians, about being together, about working together as the body of Christ, because we can come together and we can share in that experience. We're called to come together in unity. We're essential, we're equal, and we need to come together in unity. And the last point I want to go over, you guys, is I want to kind of look at the context of of what's before and after. Of course, uh, Pastor Dan taught on yesterday that this is all in context of using the spiritual gifts. I'm not going to read over it for the sake of time, but you can read over it. Verse 1 through 11 talks about the gifts that God's given us. You see, God wants us to use the gifts that He's given us. Otherwise, we're, we're like a non-functioning part of the body. We're like that, that woman with jaundice. Her liver wasn't functioning and it affected the entire thing. The man with his legs, his lymph, the lymphatic system wasn't working. It affected his entire body. When we're not using the talents that God has given us, when we're not actually putting them into action, it affects the entire body. James chapter 2 tells us that faith without works is dead, you guys. It's not enough just to be here. It's not enough just to hear the word of God, but we need to put it into action. If you look above, verse 7 through 11 says this, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. And as he wills and he gives us these gifts, we're to come together and use them for his glory. To lift each other up, to work together, functioning as one body. This is why uh, we want to run a service as a youth group. We want to start developing those gifts that God has given you. 
This is the, one of the ways that we want to, to give you your own ownership of your walk with God. See, because a lot of times, and this is how I felt when I was younger, that I was too young to do anything. I couldn't really make a difference. Uh, there were so many people already, all the roles were already filled. What was I going to do? That's not what we want for you guys. So as we're running the service, uh, and at the end of August, maybe beginning of September, that's what we want to give you guys the opportunity to do. As Pastor Ben said, we'll be doing ushers. Uh, we'll have our own youth worship team up here that we're, we're working on right now. We'll, we'll have you guys at hospitality, greeting, uh, doing the parking lot security, everything. Everything. Cleaning the bathrooms? I, cleaning the bathrooms. We're going to have some cleaning people. Remember, we're all equal in the body of Christ, so you can't, you can't be like, oh, I've got to clean the bathrooms. No, you're important. <laughs> you're like my little toe when I stubbed it. It's very important. You see, here at this church, we, we want to stretch you. We want to develop your gifts. We want to move you outside of your comfort zone. The Bible tells us to be uh, uh, content, but never complacent. We're to be happy where the Lord has us, but never just to get comfortable and lazy. And so we want to stretch you guys, and that's our desire as, as we go forward as a youth. We're going to ask you to do things. If I haven't asked you already to do things that you're uncomfortable with, I'm going to probably ask you, especially as you're here longer. I'm going to ask you to do things you're not going to like me for. That's okay. I don't have to be like but you're going to see that God's going to use it to develop you and to, to grow you into that man, that woman of God, to show you the gifts that he has designed for you. I also want to look uh, at what's said after this verse. And we're not going to read it once again for time, but does anybody know what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 speaks about? Anybody? Shout it out. Love. You see, as, as Paul is speaking about all these gifts that we have, he's speaking about tongues, prophecy, everything, all the gifts that you guys might have, he goes on to say in chapter 13 that while all those gifts are great, he's going to show you to desire a greater gift. He's going to show you a more excellent way. And verse, chapter 13 goes on to talk about love. That with all these gifts, any talent that you have, any gift that God has given you, without love, he says it's useless. It is pointless, useless, does nothing. And so as we're going out, as we, as we uh, grow as a youth group, as we're reaching out into our schools, as we're doing all these different things for the Lord, that we have that love. Not only for one another, but for those who are outside of our group. And we would be welcoming. We would invite them in. See, that's why we never want to be cliquish. We never want to have our tiny little group where no one can join in. We want to be able to go out and talk to people. And I'll, I'll ask you guys, like I said earlier, have you talked to that person? What's their name? I'll see you guys just kind of sitting in your own corner. What's that person's name over there? They just walked in. Did you notice that? I'm like, uh, I don't know. Well, there's one way to find out. Get over there and talk to them. I'm going to ask you to do those kind of things. And we want to do it in love. We want to do it as, as, as we come out together to, to build that love, to build that body of Christ. So I want you guys to remember we're all essential. We're all equal. And we all work in unity. And that understanding the role that we have to play in the body of Christ is how we take ownership of our own walk. So, uh, as we did last time, we're going to end in a time of prayer tonight. So we get the, the main lines down. Uh, and we're just going to, if you've never been in a prayer meeting, I know we have some people here that weren't here last week. We're, I'm just going to, I'll open it up in prayer. And then I'm just going to kind of bring up topics. And the youth, as well as the, the parents, are welcome to just pray about it. Lift them up to the Lord. You know, we're seeking vision. We're seeking uh, for the moving of the Holy Spirit in our youth. And so we're going to lift them up in prayer all throughout this month. And we're just going to spend uh, about 10 to 15 minutes uh, all open up in prayer and bring up the topics. And please, as the Spirit leads, uh, just go ahead. You can stand. You can sit. Try to pray loud enough that we can hear. But just lift it up to the Lord. And let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you so much for your word. That we're so privileged to have it, Lord, here in front of us. That we can learn from it and grow from it. And God, we pray that as we, we read tonight, Lord, that we would be that unified body. Working together, Lord, for your glory. That we wouldn't put anyone down or lift ourselves up, Lord, but we would understand that each of us are essential. We're all equal in the body. We're all equally important, Lord. And that we should work together in unity to function as a body. Lord, I pray for continued vision as we go out into the schools, into the streets, into uh, our homes, Lord, that we would be able to 
Be your light and be your salt, Lord. And God, I pray that as we are gathered here for prayer tonight, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would move in us and, and give us a word for one another. Give us that word of prayer, Lord. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. And right now I'm going to ask that the first topic that we're going to pray about is I want to pray about the unity as the body of Christ. And some of us, uh, the first thing I want us to pray about is that some of us I know feel negative feelings towards even each other. That there's something that's gotten in the way of, of our relationships and, and we build up kind of a resentment towards each other. And I would just like someone to pray if we can pray for the unity of, of us here as a youth group. That we would be united as one body even as the youth. So if anyone could go ahead and just pray. somebody pray for uh, unity in our families. You know, as we're at home, a lot of times that can be a place of, of kind of just strife and, and anger. And, and I mean, as, as kids, a lot of times we'll naturally grow up and we'll, we'll grow to kind of be resentful of our parents. But that's not what the Lord desires. So we have someone pray for unity even with our own families. Pray about is we're going to pray that uh, as we're 
part of the body of Christ, and many of us don't know what our, our talents are, our gifts are, uh, whether spiritual or natural. We don't know how we can be used in the body of Christ. And so we're just going to pray for, for the Holy Spirit to reveal to us our role uh, as we come together and as we serve the Lord. Um, as, as the Word said today, you know, He distributes as He sees fit, and He gives us those gifts as He desires. And so uh, we're just going to lift that up and ask that God would show us our role as we come together as the body of Christ.